The concept that we use is what's called information to transformation. And I believe that if you give people sound scientific information and they begin to learn that information, every time they learn something new, there's uh, new synaptic connections that are forged in their brain. That's what learning is. But if they don't repeat that information, if they don't review it, if they don't uh, think about it over and over again, the research shows that those circuits prune apart. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering or memories are maintaining those connections. So our model is have people retreat from their lives and change their personalities, change how they think, change how they act, and change how they feel, and that's their personality. And their personality is connected to their personal reality. So once they learn that vital information, if they can't turn to the person next to them and explain it, uh, then that model of understanding isn't wired in their brain. But if they can explain it, they begin to build the model of understanding that begins to install the neurological hardware in their brain in preparation for the experience. And the more they understand what they're doing, and the more they understand why they're doing it, the how gets a lot easier. So once they have that model clear in their mind, if I can set up the conditions in their environment and give them the proper instruction, if they can get their behaviors to match their intentions or their actions equal to their thoughts, if they can get their mind and body working together, they're going to have some type of physical transformation. So then measuring that transformation, of course, gives me more information to teach transformation. And that's the model that we use. And I now know that combining that clear intention, which is a function of brain coherence, so that they're focused on an idea, a concept, a potential reality. Combined with an elevated emotion, that elevated emotion takes them from the stress states of survival into a more elevated state. And now, emotions no longer keep us connected to our past, but it's the very fuel that drives us to our future. Not only does it have an effect on our body, but on some level it has effect on the nature of reality. So that's the model that we use. We did a study uh, in 2016 in Tacoma, Washington. We took a group of students in our advanced workshop, and we randomized the study into two groups. We had participants that were actively engaged in the advanced workshop, and we had a placebo group of people doing something completely different. We had 513 participants in the study. We did 117 brain scans. And we measured cortisol levels in a chemical called salivary immunoglobulin A. Now, immunoglobulin A is the primary defense against bacteria and viruses. It's better than any flu shot. It's the body's natural chemical that begins to create an internal defense system. And so as cortisol levels go up because of stress, IgA levels go down. Immune system is compromised as uh, stress hormones go up. Well, the reason is very simple. If you're mobilizing all your body's energy and resources for some threat in your external environment, you have very little energy for growth and repair in your internal environment. So. Our hypothesis was, well, let's see then if we teach people how to create heart coherence, to change their emotional state, to go from those survival chemicals to more elevated states, will IJ levels go up, which is what we were after more than anything else, and will cortisol levels go down? So we did salivary samples before and after the event, and our pre and post measurements were also connected to psychological evaluations. We measure people's level of post-traumatic stress disorder, their levels of happiness, their levels of pain, their levels of anxiety, as well as their physical functioning. And I think it's important to continue uh, um, assessing people's uh, changes after the event to let us know that if those changes are sustained for a period of time. And so we did several psychological assessments and evaluations that measured all of these particular areas. What we found that physiological assessment with cortisol and IgA were two markers, but we also wanted to do an analysis of what was happening in people's brains. We wanted to see if they were able to sustain a stable alpha coherent state for a period of time. We also know that when people are living in the brainwave pattern of high beta brainwave patterns, that they tend to be over aroused and overstimulated and the brain is overactive. When the brain is overly analytical and overly stimulated, uh, it's not in its most he healthy state because over time, 
brain function tends to be get, become more and more incoherent. So a student's ability to change their brain waves from beta to alpha, even into theta, and even some students approaching a deeper state of delta, allows them then to make significant changes in their internal state and also make their inner world more real than their outer world, become more suggestible to information. But what we found as a result of our four-day event that the time that they took to acquire a stable alpha state improved by 20% out of those 117 participants that had their brain measure. Their ratio between delta brain waves and beta brain waves improved by 60%. The randomized study shows that it's about one in a thousand uh, statistically that's left the chance. Their ability to move from high beta brain waves into more stable brain waves, lowering them, was improved by 124%. They increased their ability to sustain a coherent alpha brain wave state by 149%. That's pretty significant. Cortisol levels dropped to some degree, but their IgA levels, their immune function, went up almost 50%. Now, genes make proteins, and proteins are responsible for the structure and function of your body. So they used to say that genes create disease. We know that's not the truth anymore. Um, and now research shows that it's the environment that signals the gene that uh, begins to change our, our genetic expression. But emotions are the end product of experiences in our environment. So then when a student begins to embrace an elevated emotion, they're actually signaling the gene ahead of the environment because when we're talking about the environment, we're talking about the outside of the cell, which is still the inside of the body. So when a person then begins to create an elevated state, their body is the unconscious mind, is beginning to believe it's living in a new environmental condition because it does not know the difference between what's happening in their outer world and what's happening in their inner world. It's exactly the same. So in four days, we upregulated genes to promote health in our immune system. And the emotions of gratitude, the emotions of love, the emotions of care and kindness and appreciation, of inspiration, tend to be those elevated emotions that actually heal us. Why do we do that study? Because we see people with all kinds of immune-mediated conditions in a very short amount of time improve their genetic expression and improve their health. So we wanted to see if it was related to what we teach in our workshops. And there's a strong correlation now between elevated emotions and gene expression. We also had another study in Tampa in 2017 of this year uh, uh, where we did an advanced workshop and we measured gene expression once again. We measured thousands of genes and we took people once again, retreated them from their lives. We asked them then to begin to change their internal states. Meditation was the model that we used, but we did four types of meditations. We did sitting meditation, we did a standing meditation, we did a walking meditation, we did a lying down meditation. All of those different meditations were to be able to regulate a state, begin, begin to make it more natural and more of a habit. We found that in just four days there was a significant change in gene expression, and eight genes were the most common amongst the, uh, uh, the group that we studied. One of the genes that was upregulated was for neurogenesis, not just for new synaptic connections, but the growth of new neurons in response to a novel experience in learning. So then our students then were able to actually ch make significant brain changes. Another gene for cellular, re cellular repair was also activated. This particular gene activates stem cells to move to damaged tissues and aging tissues and help to regenerate them. A gene for oxidative balance, for free radical scavenging, of course, oxidative balance has everything to do with anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-inflammatory, anti-microbial. Healthy, healthy oxidative balance sustains health in a person's body. Also, we notice a gene that has to do with building cellular structures. The cellular structures called microtubules and cytoskeletons give the cell integrity. So as cells begin to repair, they need a scaffolding to repair onto, and the gene that actually creates uh, cellular structures uh, for healthy cells was also upregulated. 
You see a lot of times in a lot of our uh, students that cancer begins to change, their values begin to drop, their tumors begin to shrink, and we see in our work that the gene for suppressing cancer growth in tumors was also activated. These are the genes, specific genes, that were actually activated.